All right. So can I please have Cindy, Lindsay, Kaylee, and Jennifer up to the stage, please? All right. Before we start, I'm going to have each of you, we're going to go down the line. So you sat where you sat, you go when you go. <laughs> and just give us a quick little introduction, who you are, and so we know why we should listen to you when it comes to perinatal <laughs> massage. Um, if you guys do have questions, feel free to come up closer. But like I said, I'll run around with the mic. I could use to get some steps in. So you sat where you sat. You get to go first. Who are you? Um, hello, I'm Lindsay. Uh, I'm a registered massage therapist, a labor support doula, uh, and a spinning babies aware practitioner. I run a prenatal massage clinic in Guelph, Ontario, called, well, obviously Ontario, um, called Guelph Prenatal Massage. And I've been primarily working with pregnant bodies for, um, for the nine and a half years. And yeah. I'm Jennifer Quilty. I'm a registered massage therapist. I own my own practice, Mellow Mama Massage, which is in Arm Prior, Ontario. If anyone knows where that is, it's outside of Ottawa. <laughs> um, I've been an Arm Teen now for eight years, and the past five I've really focused on perinatal, and the past year I've been doing a lot more work with infants. Um, I'm Kaylee, and I practice in Welland, Ontario. I've been a massage therapist for 16 years, and I'm also a licensed osteo. A manual practitioner as well from Toronto and I have been focusing on pregnancy the whole time but I have started teaching pregnancy taping with K-taping for about officially about five years but I have been doing it since I was pregnant and I hated pregnancy belts so I started taping myself and that's kind of how I got here. Hi there, I'm Cindy McNeely from Trimesters. I'm the owner of that company that's been doing perinatal teaching for 29 years now and an RMT in practice for 39 years and anything pregnancy, birth, babies, postpartum, we've gone across Canada to try and educate massage therapists. All right. So I'm going to open it up. Is there anybody here that has a question for the panel in general or someone specific? Don't be shy. Oh, hello. I have a question for Lindsay. What is spinning babies? Oh, that's a loaded question, Nikki. <laughs> um, so spinning babies is basically, it's a philosophy, basically, that if we give babies space, then we open up pathways to help them navigate the birth process. Um, so spinning babies was, it's based out of America. So an American midwife named Gail Tully uh, started seeing a lot of, in her practice as a midwife, was seeing a lot of babies having trouble. Labors were stalling, babies were getting into really funky positions, and she started asking herself why, and then Spinning Babies was born. So they have a whole training uh, program that's built on using movement and body work to try to facilitate um, space for babies and opportunity for babies. It's a little bit of a deceiving name because people are like, you spin babies? What are you doing? Um, and no, that's that's not what we're doing. We're not spinning, moving um, flipping the babies in any way. Um, you may have heard of spinning babies before when you're talking about breach. So a lot of when people have a breech baby, they're like, oh, go to the spinning babies website, do spinning babies, go like, go, go upside down <laughs> and turn your baby. Um, and that's a part of it. But there's a lot more just for, for head down babies as well. And just general pregnancy health and movement and trying to facilitate um, smoother labors. Do you guys have thoughts and feelings about induction, especially for like big babies? Induction has become a very, very common uh, procedure that's being done for multiple reasons. Whether a person, a pregnant person is um, getting close to term and the medical professionals deem that they need to get the birth kickstarted. Um, it's done by a variety of ways, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, rupturing the membranes. Um, and in terms of the size of the baby, the best thing I would suggest is that you go on a site called Evidence-Based Birth. They're again out of the US, but there are people in Canada also who've been trained with them. And they have um, made it their mission to look at all the evidence-based related to different 
procedures related to pregnancy and birth and examining whether uh, medical interventions are indicated or not. And I think they would have some really great um, stats around a big baby needing to be induced. I can add to that from personal experience. I had an ultrasound the day that I delivered my daughter and they told me like throughout the whole pregnancy, she was about 40th percentile. And there's generally 20% margin of error and she came out over nine pounds. So <laughs> that's more than 20% margin of error for sure. And it's the, well, my water had broken for a long time. So they, they just forced this induction on you. Going through it, it was terrible. I would, so my second one, I, I opted out with like, there's no way. I'll pick a section first. We think, no, I'm going to go through that trauma. But I feel like it's just unnatural. The body can't go through that, uh, like that pain gate control theory. Like it can't do it naturally. So I'm not, a, I'm not a fan. My biggest issue with induction is yes, there are medical reasons to induce. The evidence doesn't support inducing for a big baby. I've seen people deliver, like, give birth to 11 pound babies. Like, and that would, that's a big baby. That's, that's a lot of person coming out of you. Um, but my biggest, pet peeve is I feel like induction is kind of treated as like it's not a big deal you know we're just going to schedule your induction because your baby's big you're past your due date it, like our placenta suddenly knows oh I'm 41 weeks it's time to just go um, and it's just treated not as a big deal and I feel like people aren't fully informed when they are being suggested an induction um, because as we've just recently heard like it's a big process. It's forcing your body to do something that it's not ready to do. And yes, while there are some instances where a baby is going to be, it is safer for a baby to be on the outside than the inside. Um, it's just induction is so overused and it's just treated like it's not a big deal. And so when I have patients that are going in for induction, it's giving them resources like EBB and having conversations with them and have, helping them navigate the conversation with their care provider so they can find out if it's really medically necessary for them to be induced um, or if it's based on really crappy stats and studies because um, it is a big deal. I think I would add to that that I think one of the things that many clients don't realize is once they undergo an induction process, basically the clock starts running. So, can't hear me? Uh, the clock starts running and if the birthing process doesn't progress, then it can lead to other interventions being needed because medical staff gets more and more worried if things aren't progressing. So, I think it has a tendency to lead to more interventions, uh, especially if clients aren't fully educated on the processes. Especially if it's their first baby too. Like you're, I think, don't quote, I think it's like you're 20 to 30% more likely to have a C-section if you're a primip, so someone that hasn't given birth before um, and you're being induced. That's, that's a huge number. Thank you. Uh, over here, we have a postpartum question. So I'm going to hand over the mic. Um, following C-sections, I just was wondering if you guys have any tips on C-section scars, like like increasing feeling again. Um, I had a C-section C-section with my daughter two years ago, and like I still have no feeling around the scar. And like sometimes I could still like if I do get feeling, sometimes it's a lot of pain. I I just. I feel for people who've had C-sections and, you know, some of my clients had their babies 20 years ago and they still are numb where the scar is. And thankfully, RMTs are doing so much great work really soon after an operative delivery. I mean, you can start with yourself right away. Um, but again, you have to know there are options. And if I had my way, surgeons would provide their patients with information about where to go to have manual work done on the scar as soon as possible. Uh, you don't have to stay numb forever. And um, sometimes the emotional connection to the scar is a challenging thing for people to actually feel okay about touching it or having someone else touch it. But I can tell you that with some manual massage work, um, you can get rid of that numbness and you can have your scar look healthier, 
happier. It's like regaining a connection to your body that's been had something done that you probably wouldn't have chosen otherwise. I'll second that. So I I did have two C-sections, not by choice, um, but I was numb for quite some time, but I have done lots of manual therapy, my own tissue. Um, I've used vitamin E, cash oil, cupping, dry brushing. Thank you. And I've also used tape as well, like K-tape, and there's another tape you can put right over top sometimes, just helps bring sensation back to the scar. You want to get it moving? Thank you. And I don't know if you know, there was a fifth person on this panel and she was unfortunately unable to make it, but she will be here teaching this weekend. Uh, that's Jeanette Yee and her class is about C-section recovery. So maybe that'll be of interest to you. <laughs> Any other questions for our panel? Right here. All right, here you go. Sorry, I forget the lady that does infant. Uh, oh, massages. Jennifer. There your focus has been. I'm just wondering um, where you've trained for doing infant massage, if you've done any extra specific stuff and yeah. um, if you just want to expand on that a little. Yeah, so I actually started with Cindy's course. <laughs> um, so Cindy teaches a great two-day course about Swedish massage, working with babies, teaching parents how to massage their infants. So um, that was the first course I took. And then right now I'm taking the Beams Craniosacral course. Um, she teaches, uh, it starts with the Foundations course for general craniosacral. And then there's four different levels um, for working with infants. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Cindy, since you were the one that started this <laughs> focus in infant massage? Um, Again, I think cranial sacral is a great add-on after doing a, a foundational course on infant massage. I One of my great um, wishes still at 40 years in is that more of our babies and children get massaged from the beginning and through their lives. It, it completely changes kids' self-esteem, self-awareness, connection to pain, connection to love, connection to joy. And it breaks my heart that so many kids with the rising um, statistics on anxiety and depression, just, I would, I when I first learned infant massage, the um, instructor said that every single family that had a birth, it was either South or North Dakota, they were uh, given an infant massage instructional session before they left the hospital. Now, there's lots of parents that it's too early. They're just trying to take care of their baby and learn how to feed and all of that. But that would be my hope for the world is that every child gets baby massaged. <laughs> To add to that as well, my daughter, um, she's almost two now, but she was born. She was so tight. We had a lot of breastfeeding issues. She had colic, reflux, didn't sleep. And body work was so, like, just foundational. She completely changed after a few months. She, um, it took a while. Um, she had oral ties as well, which is something we're seeing more and more now with infants. And I just can't express just how grateful I was that even, I had a hard time even giving her a bottle, which I didn't even know was something that was possible. And um, for me, it just completely changed my life, having someone there to help me to, to work on her. Even being an RMT, I still felt kind of lost. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, before I go to the next question, I actually have a question for you guys, because you've brought up a few things that I've heard from other massage therapists that make them nervous. A lot of therapists feel nervous working with scars, so post C-section scars. A lot of therapists are incredibly nervous working uh, with um, prenatal clients in general, just working on pregnant bodies and infants. That scares a lot of therapists. So for the people in this room, what advice would you guys have if they're interested in working in the perinatal realm, but they just feel very anxious and nervous with working with these types of clients? I wonder why they were scared in the first place. Well, you have something to start with. You're asking me. I would ask. Yeah. <laughs> well, this isn't me personally, but like I said, I've had RMTs who say, no, I just, I feel too nervous. Like for example, with a pregnant person, 
there were a lot of myths surrounding prenatal massage. I think a lot of that is gone, but there was a lot of therapists when I first started teaching that were just really, really scared to even touch a pregnant body. They would rather refer to somebody who they felt was more specialized. Do you have any advice for those people? Or again, same thing with working with babies. If they feel like they don't know how to work with a baby or scars. Like everything, you know, it's how you're taught. If I, I've heard from students that they've had instructors in massage school who didn't like pregnancy, who didn't think pregnancy was even worth teaching. And you can't come out of that kind of teaching situation loving the work. So you, anyone needs to find the instructors who have the joy and I often joke with my RMTs and students, we're Canadian, we have such low self-esteem. Over and over again, in the pregnancy courses we teach people, what do you want to learn? Confidence, confidence. And it's the same with babies. I've had people in my group who say, babies don't like me. They cry every time they see me. And bravo, they're coming to a course to learn how to do it. And they get better at it. So it's about the instruction and the passion. And then even with my students going into Sunnybrook and the high risk pregnant people, you prepare them as much as you can uh, with knowledge. And then eventually I'd have to take them to the patient's door and open the door and sort of go, you're in. <laughs> and I would come back 20 minutes later and they would be smiling and the patients would be blissed out. And everybody was just like, wow, it's just, just do it. Just do it. Anything to add? If they're really nervous, I always say if it was as easy to harm pregnancy as society makes us believe, we would have gone extinct a long time ago as a species. So <laughs> the pregnant body is robust. And yeah, just experience will be your greatest teacher. So you just need to take a deep breath and bring bring on the pregnant people bring them on okay <laughs> we have another question for you hi um, i was just wondering if any of you have had any experience with treating or working with um, hypertrophic scars in like babies or toddlers and if you have like is there anything that can be done at home to help treat it and help it heal better and like reduce the scarring or I have a little bit, yeah. I, I, but I use more myofascial work, and sometimes I'll even use um, vitamin E capsules, pierce them and put it on the scar. But it, it's time consuming. It's not one a one treatment. So as a, a male massage therapist, um, I, I work in a clinic, a multidisciplinary clinic with uh, a female focus. So the the owner is. Um, a physiotherapist and she's really big on pelvic floor physio we have two or three pelvic floor physios and it's a very client-centered practice so i end up getting a lot of uh, pregnant clients and they're pretty comfortable with me um, i'm wondering if you can share your experience with what i could do to help enhance their comfort during treatment uh, we don't have a pregnancy pillow i currently treat in side lying um, any other <laughs> tips and tricks that you would offer there's nothing wrong with treating and side lying you get your client comfortable and they'll love you forever i personally love the pregnancy pillow from being pregnant i took it home with me <laughs> <laughs> temperature control can be a big thing but you don't realize sometimes can change real quick um or you get real hot yeah i actually ran in my um my stroller fan and i put that on my uh side table and have that that can be helpful any later uh what is the latest um best practices for aromatherapy regarding pregnant clients can we use it is it helpful is it contraindicated are there any particular scents or is it just like whatever the client's comfortable with and responds well to? I don't, I don't use any scents just because some people are sensitive. Um, so I don't use any, so I'm not sure. I don't either. And I haven't studied aromatherapy in any of large capacities. So if I'm being pregnant, you're really sensitive to smells. So I think we have always just stayed away from them when you're pregnant anyway. Hospitals also have 
put no cent policies into their institutions. So, and I've had quite a few, not necessarily pregnant people, but people with environmental allergies. And I just find if you use some kind of aromatherapy oil and it's in the building, uh, the really highly sensitized clients just, they can't even come for their massages. So I don't use aromatherapy oils either anymore, which is sad because they're wonderful. Thank you. And I'm going to continue not moving because we have another question here. Hi, it's me again. Um, I have a, uh, so when you're talking about body work on infants, like, is there anything that you should look for um, in knowing that your, your child might need to have some body work done, like at a very young age? Because when my daughter was first born, like, I didn't know this, but she had a lot of stiffness in, like, her neck. And even the doctor, my lactation consultant, no one picked up on it. So by the time she got to, like, five months, that's when, like, they finally, like, let me know, like, you might want to take her to, like, a physiotherapist or get some work done on, like, her neck. So at that point, it was kind of too late to help with, like, the feeding because she was already, like, so far, like, she didn't care anymore. <laughs> so I was just wondering, like, um, like, what should you look for or, like, what can you do at the beginning to, like, decrease those chances of, like, stiffness, like, right after they're born? I think there's there's just so many red flags that generally come up, but I just think overall, everyone should just bring their infants for body work. I think that nowadays with the amount of stress that most people have and the fact that most people are more sedentary, that all, I mean, I can't speak for every single baby born, but I haven't seen a baby yet that couldn't benefit from some body work. So I think it should just be a norm eventually within our society. That's my hope. I agree. Being I agree. born is hard work. Yeah. <laughs> I find babies feed on, like when you're learning, someone's learning to breastfeed, they feed on your anxiety. It's hard work to learn to breastfeed. It's not easy. So I feel like the babies pick up on it. But I'm always looking at, if I'm looking at a baby, I look at range of motion. Can they turn their head left and right? Do they favor a side? And that's usually my, well, I think almost everybody, a baby has a favorite side for multiple reasons. And that would just be my indication that they, just, they all just need work. And if you have contact with a pediatric cranial sacral person or an osteopath who does a lot of focused work with pediatric that that's my go-to a lot of cities now have people who've done a lot of training in that realm and it's such a beautifully gentle way to assess a baby post birth i i have two questions actually the first um i've had like a lot of pregnant clients recently and very recently two of them have come in and asked if there's anything i can do to get their labor going and I'm obviously like not <laughs> I tell them like I'm not comfortable with that if there was anything I probably wouldn't do it <laughs> um but then on the flip side like is there any risk of doing anything that I could have nails that like what's a good way to respond to people asking that I guess basically I'm asking there's no magic button. If there was, we'd be millionaires and there'd be no need for the medical inductions. <laughs> I feel like don't force them out before they're ready to come out. Yeah. I went 12 days over and I did literally every single thing that you can do and she did not come out. So I just tell my clients that the baby's gonna come out when they come out and nothing I'm gonna do in here is gonna cause that baby to come out before they're ready. And even the things they have is the research is not strong. I think the only one that I've read and read about is like a stretch and sweep. Can you comment? I don't even, I'm just blocking stuff right now. I, what I, what I, <laughs> all those traumatic birth experiences, I think what I would suggest is instead of trying to um, present ourselves as if we can kickstart something, which is out of our scope of practice anyways, um, if we can de-stress our clients, and I always ask my pregnant people to book a massage two weeks after their due date. So while they're sitting there going, why isn't this happening and I'm so tired of being pregnant, at least they know they have a massage coming in sometime after their due date, which is something lovely and good for them. And that's, that's how I deal with it. Uh, um, again, there is no magic push button 
thing. And for us to pretend there is, is to go outside of our scope of practice. Well, I, I think what Lindsay said is great. I mean, if we could do it, we'd be rich, you know, and there wouldn't be an epidemic of inductions if it was that easy. Now, there are some acupuncturists out there who are very skilled with their work in helping to get the body ready for birth. So again, if somebody needs, wants something to be done, uh, if you know a good perinatal acupuncturist, that could be a, a, an avenue for them. I've had people go into labor like the, day, the night of, after their massage or like the next day and they've messaged me and they're like, Lindsay, you did it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I wish I could take, that'd be cool if massage could take credit, but um, your body was probably already in process and your baby was already ready. And sometimes the massage can be like, like Cindy said, that like beautiful, just like nice, relaxing time for themselves. Let's get that oxytocin going. Let's, um, and that can, that can all be helpful, but yeah, it's, I'm like, it's, it wasn't, you can't say that it was the massage. Uh, I just wonder, it sounds like you have to advocate for a lot of young mums now that are having babies. And I had a very difficult birth as well. And Cindy massaged my baby, by the way, <laughs> which was great. But um, what, what do you find you have to advocate more for your clients now these days? Educate. Mm -hmm. It depends if they've come from an OB versus midwife. I feel like my midwife my clients that go to midwives are more well-rounded or they've been more educated on their options. But I think education because there's so many things out there. People are reading and and taking classes and so on, but I I still find that what we do in that hour with our clients who are pregnant, um, you know, one of my clients who was very educated, very physically um, well, and at the end of her pregnancy, she was like, I'm just gonna go get induced because I'm tired of being pregnant. And so we had this conversation about, do you want, have you read about induction? Do you know what happens with induction? And she just thought they just gave you a little poke and out came the baby and there were no ramifications. So women are very smart and really educated, but I think there's nothing to replace the conversations that we can have with them. And that's, I love working with the partners too. That changes the relationship between the, the if there is one, the, the pair having the baby. And it also um, gives the partner confidence that in the situation of birth, they come through with flying colors and it's it's such a an important bonding for the pregnant person and their partner i think too a lot of it just comes down to supporting them holding space for them to to tell you their experience and i would say my biggest pet peeve right now is when you hear back from your patients that they went to their doctor and it's something with their infant and they're told just to wait and see um, so I think a lot of it is also to moms tend to have an intuition about their children and just telling them to like, giving them that support to like not give up and, and try and find the answer and try and ask for more support from their doctors because there's so many things like even just, oh, my baby doesn't like tummy time or my baby can't look that way. Like there's generally a reason for that. Um, they're just not sure. So that's a big pet peeve of mine, the whole let's, let's wait and see. Try to get my clients to advocate for more, to ask for more and expect more from their providers. Um, and, and I am seeing more of that now, like you, like getting out of your, you and your baby getting out of birth alive should be, that's like the bare minimum. You know, when you say like, well, what's your birth plan? Well, my birth plan is to like have a baby. Um, I think that we like, they need to know that they can ask for more and that from their care providers by asking questions and knowing that they have options. Uh, and that's something that I, I really that really lights me up when I get to talk to either my massage clients, my doula clients, and when you start kind of at, like probing them and like telling them that they have options, they're like, that was never mentioned to me. Thank you, Lindsay. Now I'm going to go and ask my provider to have a conversation with them um, because they they deserve more than to just make it out alive. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question over here. 
Um, so anybody can answer. I was just kind of wondering if there was generally a really common complaint that you get from either a prenatal, postpartum parent, or infant even, that you just feel like you really have the treatment like down packed. Every time this comes in, you sort of know exactly what to do or if you have any kind of tips and tricks for a technique that might work really well that you found. Her one's different. I don't know if I have a recipe. There's no recipe. I don't know. I have one for clock dogs that you can see tomorrow morning at nine. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm pretty good when clients are coming and they've got like their belly hurts or they've got signs and symptoms of brown ligament pain. I give a really good abdominal massage on the pregnant belly and usually they leave feeling really good and they continue to feel really good after. Massage your client's bellies. I'm always astounded by the amount of people that I'll talk to and they say, oh, I got massage all throughout my last pregnancy. Did they ever give you abdominal massage? No. I will second that. I've had two babies. The abdominal massages were great, but I will add to that if a therapist could really get my hips to feel good, they did their job that day. <laughs> Question over here. Do you have any favorite resources that you provide your clients with if they're looking for more information about some of the stuff that we've already talked about today? Penny Simpkins' book, uh, The Complete Guide to Pregnancy, Birth and the Newborn, is my go-to. There's a couple of brand new ones out and the titles escape me, but they're based on evidence-based care, which are really great. Um, I'm going to do a little rant right now because as Canadians, the Society of Gynecologists of Canada have on their website every clinical guideline for obstetrics and pregnancy in Canada. And at some point for probably 10, 15 years, any of us could go on that website, access it and see all the clinical recommendations for post-term, for HIV during pregnancy for gestational diabetes and then one day the SOGC decided that they would shut that website make it closed so that the only people now who have access to it are obstetricians gynecologists people who are in that sphere and also they have to pay $400 or $500 a year they reopened that site during COVID because they wanted to allow people, pregnant people who were already so stressed to have more information about care. And um, I just really encouraged all my students to get on that website and print off all those guidelines because that changes the care of pregnant women uh, when they know what the clinical guidelines are. And I've actually had people advocate for their own care because they knew what the guidelines were and they knew their OBs weren't following it. The other thing I just have to say, which is dear to my heart right now, is the increasing rise of maternal mortality in the U.S. as a result of the change of the reproductive care in the U.S. And I was coming to this talk today thinking, we are so lucky in Canada. We have so much freedom. We have so much great care. And we could lose it in a nanosecond, just like the women who are bleeding out in their cars in the states in the u.s and we need to really challenge that i was hoping when the sogc shut down their guidelines that a women's body a government body would protest that and we'd all say we are women we deserve to know what our clinical care looks like nobody said anything so we can only advocate for ourselves as much as we know what the evidence base and the clinical guidelines are I love a Cindy rant. Any <laughs> any other um, resources that you guys can recommend for people who are interested in the world of perinatal care? I use, I often refer my clients to, I'm not a lactation consultant, but I did it because I was having breastfeeding problems. So I, I guess I'm an educator, but they're on the American Lactation Consulting website. All the evidence is on there when they make changes, like they made changes to, they don't call it a blocked duct anymore. They call it a, a swollen duct. It's a narrowed duct. So like they've changed wording to the lingo, but they can find all the evidence on there and it's free. 
I love the book Reclaiming Childbirth as a Rite of Passage by Dr. Rachel Reed. I tell all my clients to run and buy that book. It's so beautiful and it's, I think it's a really nice um, meeting point between we need, to, like birth has come so so far away from like our ancestors and how, how we used to birth and become highly medicalized. And it's not taking one side or the other. It's very like meeting in the middle that we're losing this ancient wisdom, but you know, medical intervention does save lives. And so it's a, and it's a, it's a really great book. And so I'm, we have a little lending library in our clinic and that's one of my favorite ones to like point out and be like, read that book. I am a Gaskin has a really good one too. Uh, what's the title again? Um, the Complete Guide to Childbirth? Yes, that's a great one. It's a nice read because it's just stories. They're all birth stories. How soon after birth are you treating moms postpartum? Any sort of advice for treating moms coming in like really soon after the birth of their baby? Really, it varies. I tell people as soon as you feel ready. I had somebody like two weeks ago when she was five days postpartum. But then some people, I don't see them for several months. And then as a doula, I'm massaging them an hour after they've given birth. So it really just depends on on, on them. But clinically speaking, I always tell them clinically, if you've had a C-section, we're not going to do any direct work on your scar for you know the first six to eight weeks. But it's really whenever you feel feel ready for it. When you want to put on pants, that's usually the good ballpark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pants are overrated. All right, here's a question. Uh, for the lady on the left side there, um, you mentioned abdominal massage for pregnant clients. Um, how does that differ from the abdominal massage that we learned in massage school other than it's on a pregnant client? Are there any things that we should know specifically or positions uh, or techniques? Mm. I mean, the intention is very different when you're working on a pregnant body. And I think that's um, a really important thing and that makes all the difference. It's just that the intention is different. Um, I personally love doing belly massage in side lying um, because you can do a lot of lifting of the belly. Um, But yeah, as far as techniques go, a lot of it is very similar, but it's just knowing your prenatal anatomy and the anatomy of the pregnant pregnant belly and working in those areas like the lower uterine ligaments you know I do a lot of run ligament release broad ligament um, opening up up in the diaphragm Um, if if there's no baby there sometimes you can't really get in there because there's a baby Um, but just allowing them to like take nice deep breaths by really working in through the ribs Um, I mean it's kind of I could go we could go on and on and on about techniques for for the, the belly but I think the biggest difference is just the intention Thank you. And we are going to have one final question. So no pressure, but like it better be amazing. Okay. (laughs) Here's our last question for our perinatal panel. And it's amazing. I'm open to anyone's answer on this. IVF. I have had clients come to me doing IVF and vitro fertilization and saying, I can't get a massage right now because I'm doing IVF. And like, I don't want you to mess it up. And then On the flip side, I've had people come to me saying, I'm doing IVF and like, I need you to do fertility massage. Like I need you to make it work. And I'm usually, I just message Lindsay. I'm like, what do I tell them? Because I'm I'm usually just like, I don't think I can do either of those things. I don't think I can ruin it or enhance it. Like what, what do you, what do you say to people who are going through IVF and they have beliefs about massage? I think it depends what clinic they've gone to. I know some of the IVF clinics, are, there's some of the doctors are for massage. Some of them are, I know a couple of ones here in Burlington, they're really holistic. They have acupuncturists right on staff. So they're a bit more open-minded to everybody, like osteo massage. I think just depending on where they're getting the treatment from. But I try not to, I don't want to put my beliefs on them. So I'll educate them, or, you know, the clinical, and then let them decide. So much stress and fatigue and the trips for the procedures and so on. I think anything you can do to help alleviate some of the frustration and and stress and, and also grief, there's nothing that massage can do to but benefit on that level. So go for it. Okay. 
Anything else to add, perinatal ladies? Oh, sorry, I I named you the queens of the perinatal realm. Anything else to add? No? Well, then I would like everyone to thank our perinatal queens up here. Thank you.